Good afternoon. I will call the uh, Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, U.S. Postal Service and Labor Policy, Policy to order. Um, it looks like we might have votes between 2.15 and 2.30, so we will try to get as much done as we can. Um, I will uh, do my opening statement, and then uh, I think uh, the Ranking Member, Mr. Lynch, should be here uh, by then. After his opening statement, we will go into our first panel, and then after that we will set up for our next panel and, 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 uh, and questions. Uh, with that, I will begin with the um, reading of our Oversight Committee mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I uh, will now move into my opening statement. Work time that Federal employees spend performing tasks for labor unions instead of the assigned duty work they were hired to perform is referred to as official time. In 2002, former Office of Personnel Management Director K. Coles James issued a memorandum directing each Federal government department and agency to report on the number of hours of official time used by employees. After the issuance of the James Memo, OPM publicly released a report on official time usage each March until 2009, when it inexplicably ceased reporting this information. Repeated requests for the report on official time usage for fiscal year 2009 were made by the Competitive, Enter Competitive Enterprises Institute and Representative Phil Gingry of Georgia. However, the report was not produced until after Chairman Issa and I sent a letter to OPM requesting it on April 21st. Last month, OPM finally issued an interim response to our request, 19 months following the, the end of fiscal year 2009. The report indicated that Federal employees spent nearly 3 million hours of official time on union activities in 2009. This came at a cost of $129 million to American taxpayers, $8 million higher than the previous fiscal year. To put these numbers in perspective, American taxpayers spent enough on official time activities in 2009 to fund a full-time workforce of over 1,400 employees for an entire year at an average annual salary of $90,000. OPM's lengthy delay in releasing information related to official time raises serious transparency concerns. But the very necessity of allowing Federal employees to conduct union activities at taxpayer expense also needs to be explored. There is no evidence that official time has a positive impact on productivity. When an employee is on official time, he or she is not available to perform the duties for which they were hired. I ask, can we afford such charity given the fiscal problems facing our country? Congressman Gingrey has introduced the Federal Employee Accountability Act to do away with official time, which would save taxpayers an estimated $1.2 billion over 10 years. I am proud to be a co-sponsor of that legislation. I will myself be introducing a bill in response to OPM's failure to live up to the Obama Administration's transparency pledge. My bill will mandate the production of an annual official time report no later than March 31st of each calendar year. Americans deserve to know how their taxpayer dollars are being spent. OPM's delay in reporting information on the use of official time, coupled with the National Labor Relations Board's uh, decision to sue Boeing, as well as the states of Arizona and South Dakota, raises concerns as to whether this administration is pursu pursuing a decidedly pro-union agenda at the, sound, at, the, at the expense of a sound workforce policy. At a time when our economy is in a recession, and budget deficits are at staggering record levels, efficiency is imperative. Taxpayers should not have to continue footing the bill for union welfare particularly when little evidence exists that official time is improving government productivity. This hearing presents an opportunity for lawmakers on this committee to hear important testimony about whether official time is a good value for the American taxpayer. I thank the witnesses for appearing here today, and I look forward to their testimony. Um, I see, uh, uh, and I will uh, recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Cummings from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing will not increase government efficiency or value to the taxpayer. This hearing, like the other labor policy hearings this committee has held, is meant to provide justification for removing workplace rights for public workers. It mirrors what Republican governors around the country are doing to public workers in their states. That is why today we are focusing on a program that consumes a tiny fraction of Federal employee time and actually saves the taxpayers money. 
Federal employee unions enjoy few of the rights of private sector unions. Federal employees may not strike, and in most circumstances, they are legally precluded from negotiating pay, pay or benefits. There are strict limits to what may be done on official time. It cannot be used to solicit membership in unions or perform other union-specific or political business. Federal employees may, on official time, perform certain representational duties. They cannot negotiate with management to set employment standards and find solutions. <coughs> they can negotiate with management to set employment standards and find solutions to problems arising in the workplace. These efforts can improve the operation of the Federal Government. For example, official time can improve personnel management by enabling facilities to develop internal dispute resolution processes. More than 14 years ago at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, union leadership and Army management instituted a negotiated alternative dispute resolution program. During that time, only three grievances have gone to a third party arbitration. The alternative dispute resolution panels, which are composed of both management and bargaining unit employees, are empowered to investigate and make decisions on employee complaints. This process is estimated to have saved the Federal Government thousands of dollars in third party expenses at this one inst installation alone. In recent years, the average number of official time hours per bargaining unit uh, employee has declined. In 2009, bargaining uni unit employees, on the average, dedicated just 2.58 hours to official time over the course of the entire year. When compared to the cost of formal dispute resolution, the time savings are substantial. Official time allows Federal employees and managers to concentrate on ensuring that work is completed on time and that considerations regarding work conditions are handled quickly, effectively, and cooperatively. Today we will hear from my colleague, Mr. Gingrey, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, who will speak on H.R. 122, which is legislation he introduced basically to eliminate the use of official time for elected Federal employee union representatives to engage in representation activities on behalf of collect collective bargaining uh, unit employees. Again, uh, Mr. Chairman, H.R. 122 seems to be a solution in search of a problem. While there are costs associated with official time, the benefits far outweigh the costs. No evidence has been presented to this subcommittee to suggest that eliminating official time would result in any cost savings. To the contrary, alternative dispute resolution panels like those at Sam, uh, Fort Sam Houston save the government from the steep costs associated with employment-related litigation. Mr. Chairman, there is a tremendous value in allowing employees and management to solve problems together internally. If official time is prohibited, those efforts would also be considerably reduced, an outcome that would not be beneficial to employees, management, or the taxpayer. And with that, I yield back and thank the Chairman for his courtesy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cummings. I now recognize the Chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, for his opening statement. I thank you, Chairman. And I thank the Ranking Member for his comments, because usually we go in the other order. Uh, and I think today it is particularly important that I go afterwards because I have worked in union shops and I have worked in non-union shops. This is the only government shop I have ever worked in, other than the Army. It is very clear that the ranking member, although he may be well-intended, is missing the point. Elimination of official time would not eliminate decisions by management and labor representatives to do alternative dispute resolution, to do other things that was in the, determined by management I repeat, determined by management to be productive or helpful. If the ranking member believes that the gentleman from uh, uh, Georgia's legislation doesn't do that, as we go through the process once it's presented to us, I would pledge to make sure that it did, in fact, still allow management to expend official time in order to get to the final and best resolution regardless. But I think there is a huge different debate here, and as we hear from the Congressman from, uh, from Georgia, I think what we are going to hear is, in fact, that this is simply a blank check 
for the shop stewards and the other people in the union to be paid with Federal dollars and do whatever they want to do in the promotion of their political views or their union activities. That is not really what we think is in the best interest. Now, I am going to just do a hypothetical before I yield back. If this bill becomes law, will unions stop to exist? No. Will union organization and union activity stop? No. Will, in fact, union representatives have to choose between working full time and doing extra work or being paid for with union dues to do union work? I think that is a legitimate question, and I hope as we consider this bill in its current form and with any proposed amendments that we begin asking the question, who should pay for union activities and, in fairness to the gentleman from Georgia, how we should make sure that when you have management labor dispute and activities related to the shop floor, work safety, any of those things, that in fact it is not unacceptable or uncommon for management to pay, if you will, for both sides of that discussion. So I look forward to the gentleman's testimony. I look forward to the bill uh, being uh, introduced. And I very much look forward to the opportunity to make sure that it accomplishes both, a value for the taxpayer and fairness for workers and management's ability to work together. And with that, I thank you, Chairman, for calling this hearing and yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for his opening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to thank our opening panelists, Representative Gingrey of Georgia, uh, and thank all of our witnesses today for helping this subcommittee with its work. Uh, today's hearing will examine the use of, quote, official time, close quote, uh, at federal and uh, by Federal employees and ask the question of whether those workers and the best interests of the American taxpayer are served when a Federal employee exercises his or her statutory right to receive official time, given that we will also be considering the merits of legislation, H.R. 122, to severely restrict the availability of official time. I believe that many of my colleagues in the majority have already reached their conclusion. Notably, this hearing comes to the, on the heels of a series of other uh, subcommittee hearings that have been focused uh, to a point on, on turning the finger of blame at our hardworking Federal employees as a primary cause of government overspending and the difficulties in the economy in which we find ourselves. I am, again, mystified how uh, we all agree that Wall Street caused this problem, the reckless behavior of uh, rating agencies that uh, stamped AAA on anything that would, would uh, anything that moved, and yet when the blame for all of this comes around, the finger of blame falls upon Federal employees or police or firefighters or teachers. I don't know how the blame landed on them, but it is apparently the agenda of my, my friends across the aisle that this is, this is where the, the, the source of the problem lies. In the name of fiscal responsibility, this subcommittee has chosen to focus its attention on whether our Federal workforce is overpaid, regardless of the high skill level uh, or educational level and experience of our, our Federal employees, uh, which on average in comparison to their private sector counterparts are much better positioned. We have also examined whether we can achieve cost savings by cutting our Federal workforce across the board, regardless of the exorbitant costs of private contracting that has completely been ignored and is about four times the size of the uh, basic Federal workforce. And now the subcommittee is keeping its attention on Federal workers by targeting the use of official time, regardless of the essential role that official time plays when it comes to agency cost savings, efficiency, productivity and safety. Under the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978, the Federal employees represented by a union may be granted, quote, official time to perform certain representational activities during work hours that serve the joint interests of both labor and management. In particular, Federal law provides that the amount of time that may be used is limited to that which both labor and management agree is reasonable, necessary, and in the public interest. So we have to have an agreement right now between labor and management that the time 
awarded is reasonable. That is the law. That is what is going on right now. In other words, while the Federal employees may request official time, Federal managers and supervisors retain exclusive approval authority over these requests. But that is not good enough. That is not good enough for some of my friends on the other side of the aisle. They don't want that. They want it to be just cut out altogether. This is absurd. Give me a break. Accordingly, permissible official time activities may include employee participation in labor management meetings that seek to identify ways to improve agency productivity, workplace safety, or employee training. In addition, Federal employees on official time may also work to enforce employee protections against unfair discrimination and employment. Hello? Let me also say what official time is not. Under Federal law, official time may not be used for solicitation of union membership. It may, may not be used for the purpose of conducting union uh, meetings or elections, and it may not be used to conduct any partisan political activities. I am a former union steward, a former union executive board member, a former union president. Mr. Chairman, in contrast to the assertions that have been made regarding the misuse of official time by Federal workers, I would point out that official time has enjoyed a longstanding bipartisan support as a necessary and effective tool by which management and labor can work together to improve agency efficiency, productivity and safety. Safety. We have a lot of employees out there that work in a, in a, a difficult and hazardous environment, and this is important to them coming home every day safely and, and in a healthy fashion to their families. Uh, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I see my time is about to expire, and I yield back, and I thank the gentleman for, for his courtesy. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our first panel, Congressman Phil Gringy from, from Georgia. Uh, you are recognized. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Issa, thank you. Uh, uh, Ranking Member uh, Lynch, uh, Member uh, Cummings, other members of the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, United States Postal Service and Labor Policy, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify on an important issue facing the Federal Workforce. Uh, it has already been mentioned in your opening statements uh, in, in regard to opposition uh, to uh, legislation that I have proffered, H.R. 122, uh, that in, in some way this takes away rights of uh, the Federal uh, worker uh, in regard to collective bargaining. I think it was referenced that uh, some of the things that are going on in, in, in various states, Wisconsin in particular. Uh, but I want to make it very clear in, in starting my opening statement that uh, this bill that I have proffered, H.R. 122, which you will consider, uh, in no way, shape, or form takes away uh, any Federal employee's rights to collective bargaining, indeed to uh, represent representational activity on behalf of those uh, uh, union uh, members who are designated to, to uh, arbitrate uh, and file grievances on their behalf. The question is, uh, uh, basically, who pays for that? Uh, and under current law, and since uh, 33 years ago when the Civil Service Reform Act was passed in 1978 and signed into law by President Jimmy Carter, uh, the issue uh, basically stated that official time uh, could uh, include whatever is reasonable in the public interest. Uh, well, that is not very definitive. Uh, and over the 33 years uh, since the passage of that law, uh, the use, in my opinion, of official time has, has been abused, quite frankly. Uh, and those who uh, pay for official time are we, the taxpayer. Uh, not uh, you, the union member. Uh, and, and I don't think that's right. Uh, I, I, the ranking member uh, mentioned uh, that, that, that in some way uh, this bill is, is placing the blame on the Federal workforce uh, for the cause of the debt and the deficit uh, and putting the, backs, uh, putting the burden on the backs of our hardworking Federal employees. Uh, my bill uh, does really nothing of the kind, and as you, as you peruse it and hopefully mark it up, uh, maybe even change it a bit, uh, I think you will come to that same conclusion. 
uh, again, uh, when, the, when the law was passed in, in Civil Service Reform Act in, in 1978, there was no requirement for any report on the total amount, the total number of hours, the total expenses uh, of official time. In fact, in the past uh, 33 years, uh, only nine times have reports been issued. Uh, although in 2002, uh, the director, then director of the Office of Personnel Management, uh, put out a directive to all agencies of the federal government in the interest of full disclosure uh, to the taxpayer, uh, you will issue a report uh, and put it, file it on your website in a timely fashion. Uh, during those five or uh, four or five years, uh, from 2002 to 2007, what we found was the total number of hours uh, used in uh, official time hours on, on filing grievances, collective bargaining, walking around, whatever that is, on the behalf of, of uh, the union representational uh, activity, uh, have increased. The total number of hours and the total amount of expense to we, the taxpayer, uh, over a hundred million dollars, by the way, and that's not nickels and dimes, uh, members of the subcommittee, and I think you would agree with that, and I think it's the responsibility uh, of us as, as, and particularly your committee, and, and certainly particularly your uh, subcommittee, Chairman Ross, uh, to take a close, hard look at this with a sharp pencil make sure that no rights are taken away from federal employees. And again, as I say, my bill does not do that. It comes down to the, the question of who's going to pay for it. And today, uh, who pays for it uh, are, are the taxpayers, uh, not uh, the, the union dues. Union dues are used for other things, uh, political activity, uh, signing up new members, uh, lobbying on behalf of specific issues, either for or against. Uh, indeed, when we uh, offered this as an amendment uh, to the CR uh, just, uh, what, not even a month ago, uh, the, the, we, we received, I received as a member, uh, an email from, from uh, uh, a, an employee of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency urging me as a member not to support this amendment. Uh, and, you know, that was at 2.30 in the afternoon that I received that email. I don't know whether this employee was a, uh, a designated uh, representative of the, of the union for that particular division of the EPA, uh, but whether they were, were officially the representative or just an employee for the EPA, during that period of time at 2.30 in the afternoon, they were supposed to be working, uh, doing EPA work, very important work, for we the taxpayer. Yet, they were lobbying members of Congress to vote against this bill. And that's totally disallowed uh, in the uh, Civil Service Reform Act of 1978. So, you know, we clearly have a problem. Uh, I, obviously, in, in the five minutes, and I appreciate your patience with me, Mr. Chairman, because I know I've gone over a little bit, but I have submitted uh, the, my entire uh, report to the committee for the official record. But I just think that the responsible thing for members on both sides of the aisle is to address this issue. If my bill is not perfect, and I feel pretty confident that it's not perfect, you go over it with a sharpened pencil and a fine tooth comb and make sure that we get it right because hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and since the reporting has not been done in a timely manner, in fact not done at all in a couple of the last three or four years, the, the amount of, of time spent on official uh, time uh, by people making $30, $40 an hour, not working at all for the taxpayer, has actually gone up and the cost has gone up. So with that, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, once again, I, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Gingrey, and we appreciate you being here. With that, we'll take a short recess, recess to prepare for the next panel. Thank you.
will now welcome our second panel of witnesses. Uh, the, our first witness is Mr. Timothy Curry. He is the Deputy Associate Director for the Partnership and Labor Relations at the Office of Personnel Management. Uh, we have Mr. Vincent Vernuccio, is the Labor Policy Counsel at the Competitive Enterprises Institute. Um, next, we have Mr. James Shirk, who is a Senior Policy Analyst in Labor Economics at the Heritage Foundation. And then we have Mr. John Gage, who is the National President of the American Federation of Government Employees. I thank you all for being here. Uh, pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses must be sworn in before they testify. If you wouldn't mind, please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Uh, in order to allow time for discussion and questions, please limit your testimony to, to five minutes. And with that, I will um, recognize Mr. Curry for an opening statement. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today about the use of official time in the Federal Civil Service. As President Barack Obama stated in Executive Order 13522, Federal employees and their union representatives are an essential source of frontline ideas and information about the realities of delivering government services to the American people. The Office of Personnel Management and the Administration believe that collective bargaining in the Federal sector provides an efficient, structured framework for engaging employees and giving them a voice in workplace matters. Official time is a critical component of the carefully crafted collective bargaining system that Congress created for the Federal Government. Union membership in the Federal sector is a choice, but Federal employee unions are required by law to represent all employees in the bargaining unit, even those who choose not to become dues-paying union members. Official time is essential to the union's ability to meet the statutory obligation. Labor and management need to be accountable for ensuring that official time is used appropriately and not abused. To assist them, OPM has voluntarily produced reports on official time usage since 2002 with its latest report covering fiscal year 2009. The first report on official time prepared by OPM was published in 1998 when OPM was directed to prepare a report for the House Committee on Appropriations. Subsequently, OPM began preparing reports on official time usage on its own initiative since fiscal year 2002 and most recently for the period covering fiscal year 2009. We continue to refine our methods for official time data collection. Prior to the fiscal year 2009 report, OPM collected the data from agencies manually. Fiscal year 2009 was the first time OPM relied upon agency official time usage data extracted from the Enterprise Human Resources Integration System where possible. The report covering fiscal year 2009 was released a few weeks ago on May 17, 2011. An agency's official time wage cost is determined by multiplying the reported official time hours by each agency's average bargaining unit employee hourly wage plus fringe benefits. During fiscal year 2009, there were 1,159,396 non-postal Federal Civil Service bargaining unit employees represented by labor unions. Agencies reported that bargaining unit employees spent a total of 2,991,378 hours performing representational duties on official time. The number of official time hours used per bargaining unit employee on representational matters during fiscal year 2009, on average across the government, was 2.58 hours. And comparing fiscal year 2008 and fiscal year 2009 data, the cost of official time hours increased by 6.93 percent. However, official time costs represented less than two-tenths of one percent, or 0.0013197 percent to be exact of the civilian personnel budget for Federal Civil Service bargaining unit employees. We have just initiated efforts to develop a report for the period covering fiscal year 2010 and plan to complete the survey later this year. Additionally, the fiscal year 2009 report is now posted on the OPM website, and OPM staff is currently working to post all past reports on its website in the spirit of transparency. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Um, Mr. Vernuccio, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing and providing me the opportunity to discuss the issue of official time in the Federal workforce. My name is Vincent Vernuccio, and I am Labor Policy Counsel at the Competitive Enterprise Institute and editor of WorkplaceChoice.org. CEI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy organization that focuses on regulatory issues from a free market and limited government perspective. 
WorkplaceChoice.org is a comprehensive, up-to-date website for news on labor regulations, private and government sector unions, pensions, and pro-worker legislation. Official time is not a good value for the taxpayer and does not serve the public interest. Title V of the U.S. Code allows Federal Government employees to perform union duties unrelated to their jobs while still being paid their government salary, which is ultimately funded by the taxpayer. This process is called official time. There is no legislative or regulatory requirement for the government to report to taxpayers how much of this time is utilized by government unions. In fiscal year 2009, Federal Government employees logged almost 3 million hours of work for union work while still receiving a paycheck from the taxpayers. These hours are compensated and are not volunteer benevolence. Taxpayers should not be forced to subsidize union activity, and Congress should repeal the section of Title V that authorizes official time. However, as long as official time is allowed, taxpayers should have easy access to detailed information on its usage and its cost. Congress should require OPM to report official time usage on an annual basis and publish the findings online. Official time amounts to a significant and inappropriate government subsidy for union activity paid for by the taxpayers. Official time costs taxpayers over $129 million for work of no appreciable benefit to them. Those figures represent time and money that could have been spent on the government's other administrative duties. This does not include the cost of administering official time, union office space in government buildings, or official time travel expenses. It does not take into account the cost of dealing with the plethora of frivolous complaints stemming from the no cost to the union, but of much cost to the government, grievances. These expenses could raise the actual cost of taxpayer union subsidies significantly. Civil service laws provide many of the protections to Federal Government employees in areas where the union's scope to negotiate is limited by statute. This makes many traditional representation functions unnecessary and further decreases the need for official time. Federal employees do not bargain over wages, benefits, and many working, condition that are working conditions that are key points of contention for workers in the private sector and in many States. The Act covers merit system principles, personnel practices, labor management relations, and a myriad of other workplace issues. Statute gives Federal employees many of the protections for which official time is supposedly needed. This renders the value of official time for activities questionable for both Federal workers and for taxpayers. Federal government unions have hundreds of thousands of members and take in millions of dollars in dues each year. In 2010, the American Federation of Government Employees receipts were over 103 million, the National Treasury Employees Union exceeded 39 million, and the National Federation of Federal Employees 5.5 million. These totals are only for the above union's national headquarters and do not include receipts from locals. In addition, there are many other unions that represent government employees that have not been mentioned. In some instances, these unions are not required to represent non-members, such as in front of the Merit System Protections Board or U.S. Courts. These unions do have the money to pay for the representation of their members. It is unfair to force the taxpayer to foot the bill. If official time is not revoked, however, Congress should enact legislation to mandate its reporting. In its fiscal year 2009 report, OPM stated twice there are no legal or regulatory requirements to publish any official time data. OPM says it voluntarily chose to issue the call and guidance for fiscal year 2009. OPM's acknowledgment that it is not required to publish this report clearly indicates that the agency could discontinue it at its discretion. The need for the report is actually twofold. First, taxpayers should be able to know how much of their tax dollars are being used to fund official time. Second, required reporting of official time will allow Federal employees to hold their agencies accountable if it is continued to be mandated by law. In conclusion, official time is a bad deal for taxpayers. Congress should repeal its usage and end the public subsidy of union activity. I applaud Ms. Uh, Congressman Gingrey for Bill 120, H.R. 122. And short of that, it should also legislate OPM to report official time usage on an annual basis. And Congressman Ross, I applaud you for your potential bill. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'd like to thank this opportunity for the subcommittee, and I'd welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bernuccio. Mr. Shirk, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify. My name is James Shirk, and I am a senior policy analyst in labor economics at the Heritage Foundation. However, the views I present in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing an official position of the Heritage Foundation. 
This afternoon, I want to explain to you why paying government employees to do union work does not provide good value for the taxpayer. Congress should be aware of three significant problems with this official time. The first problem with official time is that it subsidizes Federal unions attending to private business. Unions exist to represent their members. Their core mission is to negotiate collective bargaining agreements and represent workers with grievances. Union members pay dues so that unions can provide these services. Without official time, unions would hire full-time employees to perform these union duties. Instead, the taxpayers pay for it. Official time requires taxpayers to cover the cost of union representation. Many Federal employees actually spend all their time at work on union business. This cost taxpayers $129 million in 2009. Now, unions, of course, enjoy the subsidy, but it does not provide good value for the taxpayer. While unions do use some official time on matters of public interest, such as discussions with management on how to improve productivity or workplace safety, they spend large amounts of official time on matters of no public concern. Federal unions bargain such issues, such as how to assign parking spaces or how to implement telecommuting policies. These issues matter only to Federal employees. The public should not bear the union's cost of negotiating them. If Federal employees believe that union representation improves their working conditions, then they should pay for that representation themselves. Taxpayers should not pay government employees to do union work. A second problem with official time is that it encourages unions to file frivolous grievances. With official time, it is taxpayers, not the union, who pay for the cost of union representation and grievance proceedings. This subsidizes filing trivial complaints that unions would not spend their own money pursuing. Several recent cases demonstrate the frivolous charges that unions uh, do, in fact, bring. For example, at Randolph Air Force Base, the American Federation of Government Employees Local asked to renegotiate its collective bargaining agreement. However, the local did not offer any proposals to management to bargain over. After four months, without the union stating what they wanted to discuss, the Air Force terminated negotiations. The union then filed a grievance against the Air Force for refusing to bargain with them. In another case, in a Federal prison in West Virginia, the collective bargaining agreement expressly prohibited wearing jeans at work. The union president nonetheless repeatedly wore jeans, despite being reminded of this policy. The union president also used the prison email system to email employees about purely uh, union matters. The warden told the union president to change out of the jeans and to stop using the work email system for union matters. In response, the union filed unfair labor practice charges. Now, these complaints were baseless and the Federal Labor Relations Authority rejected them. But before that happened, taxpayers paid for counsel representing the government, a Federal labor arbitrator, and a court reporter. Each grievance cost the taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars. Requiring unions to pay for grievance representatives out of union dues would discourage bringing meritless charges. Unions would be far more circumspect if grieving cost them money, not the taxpayers. And reducing the number of frivolous grievances could save the government millions of dollars. The third problem with official time is that it subsidizes government unions' political agendas. Federal employees may lobby Congress while on official time if they are lobbying over Federal working conditions. Union officials can and do lobby Congress for more generous benefits while being paid by taxpayers to perform public service. Official time also permits Federal unions to spend more on politics. Without official time, unions themselves would pay union representatives to negotiate collective bargaining agreements and represent their workers in grievance proceedings. Because the taxpayers cover those costs of their core mission, the unions have more money to spend elsewhere, such as on politics and lobbying. And Federal unions do spend considerable sums on politics. In 2010, the American Federation of Government Employees National Headquarters spent $4.1 million on politics and lobbying. The National Treasury Employees Union spent $1.8 million on these same activities. Federal unions could not spend this much if they had to use their own members on their core mission of representing their members. Unions now, of course, have every right to lobby for their preferred policies and campaign for their preferred candidates. The taxpayers, however, should not have to subsidize this. Many Americans do not want Federal pay to rise and oppose the political candidates that Federal unions support. Taxes collected from every American should not subsidize Federal unions' political agendas. Congress can correct these problems by sharply restricting the use of official time. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to explain the problems with official time and why it does not provide good value for the taxpayer. Thank you, Mr. Shirk. Uh, Mr. Gage, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Lynch and members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the 650,000 Federal employees represented by AFGE, 
Thank you for inviting me to testify today on official time for volunteer Federal employee representatives. In January of 1962, President Kennedy signed Executive Order 10988, which gave Federal workers for the first time the right to unionize and collective bargain with their agencies. Seven years later, President Nixon issued Executive Order 11491, which reaffirmed and expanded those rights. Those orders and the statute which succeeded them, the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978, required Federal employee unions to provide representation for all employees in their collective bargaining units, even those who choose not to pay dues. Under this open shop arrangement, Federal unions are also forbidden from collecting any fair share fees from nonmembers for the services which the union must provide. In exchange for the legal obligation to provide the same services to those who pay as well as those who choose not to pay, the executive orders and the CSRA allowed Federal unions to bargain with agencies over official time. Depending on the contract, Federal employees who serve as volunteer employee representatives may use reasonable amounts of approved official time to engage in representational activity while in duty, in duty status. Legally permitted representational activities include creating fair merit-based promotion procedures, establishing flexible work hours and telework opportunities, setting procedures that protect employees from on-the-job hazards, enforcing protections from unlawful discrimination, participating in work improvement processes, and providing workers with a voice in determining their working conditions. The Civil Service Reform Act provides that the amount of official time for these representational responsibilities is limited to that which the union and the agency agree is reasonable, necessary, and in the public interest. The amount of time must be negotiated by the two parties. It is not a blank check for the union. In addition, the statute clearly states that the activities performed by an employee related to the internal business of the union must be performed while in a non-duty status. Such activities include solicitation of membership, internal union meetings, election of officers, and partisan political activities. I want to emphasize, Mr. Chairman, that official time may not be used for the activities I just mentioned. Finally, Federal employees may file appeals of personnel actions outside the scope of the union's negotiated contract. Such appeals may be through an agency's internal administrative grievance procedures or EEO programs, to MSPB for adverse personnel actions such as suspensions, removal and reductions in force, to DOL and or the MSPB for violations of veteran preference rules, to DOL for workers' compensation, and to OPM for Fair Labor Standard Act violations. These statutes themselves provide a reasonable amount of time to employees and their representatives, union or not, in order to file such appeals. Through official time, employee representatives work together with Federal managers to make our government better. Gains in quality, productivity and efficiency simply would not have been possible without the reasonable and sound use of official time. Private industry has known for years that a healthy and effective labor management relationship improves customer service and is often the key to survival in a competitive market. The same is true in the Federal Government. No effort to improve governmental performance, whether it is called reinvention, restructuring or reorganizing, will thrive in the long haul if labor and management maintain an arm's length adversarial relationship. In an era of severe budget cutting, it is essential for management and labor to develop a stable and productive working relationship. If workers and management are really communicating workplace problems that would otherwise escalate into costly lit litigation can be dealt with promptly and more informally. Employee representatives use official time for joint labor management activities that address operational, mission-enabling issues in the agencies. Such activities are designing and delivering joint training of employees on work-related subjects, introducing new programs and work methods that are initiated by the agency or suggested by the union. As examples, such changes may be technical training of health care providers in the VA or introduction of data-driven food inspection in the Department of Agriculture. 
employee representatives use official time for routine and unusual problem solving of emergent and chronic workplace issues, particularly in health and safety programs, which emphasize effective systems to prevent workplace injuries and illnesses. Official time is also used by employee representatives participating in programs such as Lean and Six Sigma labor management collaborative collaborative efforts which focus on improving quality of products and procedural efficiencies. Currently, DOD employee representatives are, are participating on official time to develop new performance management and accelerated hiring systems. To ensure its continued reasonable and judicious use, all Federal agencies track basic information on official time and submit it annually to OPM, which then compiles a government-wide report. From fiscal year 2008-2009, total official time hours government-wide have in increased 3.37 percent, but the total number of hours expended per bargaining unit employee fell from 2.6 to 2.58. Mr. Gage, if I can get you to wrap it up, but we're a little in over conclusion, here. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, okay. AFG strongly proposes any proposals to erode the contractual and statutory rights of employee represented to use official time to represent both dues-paying and non-dues-paying members of collective bargaining units. Official time is a long-standard necessary tool that gives agencies and their employees the means to expeditiously and effectively utilize employee input into mission-related challenges of the agency as well as to bring closure to conflicts that arise in all workplaces. It has enjoyed bipartisan support for almost 50 years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gage. And I will recognize myself now for five minutes for questions. Uh, Mr. Curry, the, the, the question I have got to ask you is, since to, uh, 2002 there has been an uh, annual report up through 2009 from OPM as to official time. But for some reason, inexplicable to me, there has been a 20-month delay. Can you explain why there has been a 20-month delay in, in rendering the report? Uh, yeah, I would be happy to answer your question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I arrived at OPM in August of 2010, and as I began assessing the programs I had responsibility for, uh, I determined that the official time report for 2009 had not been accomplished yet. There was a variety of reasons why that would be. Uh, there was a reorganization at OPM. There was a turnover in the staff in my office. Ultimately, that had some impact on starting the report. We also decided to take a different approach. I direct my staff in mid to late September uh, to begin compiling the data for the report. And as I noted in my opening remarks, uh, instead of manually collecting the data, we decided to take a different approach and extract the data from a data system and then ask agencies to validate the data. So the recent report that is, you would say is accurate, is, is at least as accurate as the ones previously submitted? Yes, sir. And with regard to a report on 2010, is that in the uh, works? We, we are in the process of starting to gather that data and expect to have that finished by September. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, uh, now, now, I also understand that there are some Federal employees that 100 percent of the time is on, on um, uh, official time. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And, and how many employees would you say that is? Uh, we do not track that data. Those reports uh, don't reflect that. Uh, but, uh, the hours for those employees on 100 percent official time would be reflected in the total agency hours that are reported to us. And, and if you are on 100 percent official time, uh, do you then get, are you eligible for and receive pay increases, annual pay increases? Uh, uh, I, I could. You are not eligible for a performance rating because you are not performing agency assigned work. So, therefore, you are not eligible to receive a performance award or a quality step increase based on performance. You are eligible for the annual pay adjustments as well as within grade step increases. So, okay. Um, can, if, if Federal employees are on official time, can they lobby Congress? Uh, there is no statutory right to official time to lobby Congress. Uh, however, as part of the contractual right to negotiate on official time, it is negotiable for a union to propose to receive official time to lobby Congress on workplace-related matters. So would it be safe to say, then, that those times that are reported as official time lobby in Congress are done in pursuant to a contract based on collective bargaining? Yes, sir. As opposed to being statutorily Correct. Uh, authorized. Um, let me ask you about uh, the, the location. When, do any of the employees do official time off location, in other words, off their work situs? Uh, I, I don't have that information, sir. Would you, would you have any idea? I, I would not know that answer. Sir. Um, uh, given that most employees cannot collectively bargain over pay and benefits, can you discuss in detail the sorts of activities labor union representatives negotiate when on official time? Uh, uh, certainly. I can give you different examples. Uh, 
Uh, one, one big example would be negotiating over merit promotion procedures where uh, uh, unions could negotiate procedures for fair and honest competition for bargaining employees for competing for Federal jobs. Uh, you could see uh, contract provisions dealing with safety requirements for workplace uh, matters as far as to ensure that the uh, procedures are set in place to ensure that uh, it is the safest environment for employees. Uh, you could see procedures for negotiating how overtime work assignments are made. Uh, so there are different workplace matters that they do negotiate on how you accomplish things. Now, I am going to be filing a bill that would require OPM to pr produce this report annually at the end of March. Do you have any, do you think OPM would object to that? And I am just uh, modifying we, that. We would not have any position on the bill at this time, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Vinicio, um, with regard to the private sector um, unions, uh, is, is there any tracking or data available as to how much union time is spent by private sector employees um, uh, on, on private sector payrolls? Uh, the main report for private sector unions and uh, some Federal unions is the LM2, which is available on the Department of Labor's um, unionreports.gov. And I am not sure if there is any line on there that tracks in the collective bargaining, excuse me, in the collective bargaining agreement how much uh, is actually spent on, well, the private sector uh, version of official time. There are some private sector collective bargaining agreements that do have, uh, that do have the equivalent of uh, paid shop stewards. Mr. Shirk, are, are you familiar with uh, how the, 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 that relates between private sector unions and public sector unions and official time? Uh, the, the GAO took a look at this back in 1996 uh, through 98 when there were a lot of uh, investigations into this. And their finding was about, uh, they examined a number of collective bargaining agreements. About half of private sector companies permit some form of official time and half do not. So it is about an even split in the private sector between allowing it and not. Okay. Uh, I see my time is up, so I will um, uh, recognize um, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our witnesses. Uh, let me try to give a concrete example. Uh, I was elected on September 11, 2001 in the Democratic Party in Massachusetts. Uh, when I came to Congress uh, a few weeks later, uh, there was anthrax in, in some of the Federal buildings, including uh, the Brentwood uh, Postal Facility not far from here. And uh, tragically, uh, two of my uh, postal clerks, Thomas Morris, Jr. and Joseph Kersine, Jr., uh, died of anthrax inhalation. Now, because there was anthrax in a number of facilities in New York as well, uh, there was a lot of involvement by the union representatives. Uh, there was anthrax. It was uh, difficult to uh, detect. It had uh, killed two, two workers and injured some others. Uh, so they used a lot of official time. They used official time to protect the other workers. There was actually a moment during that period uh, when, because of the attacks uh, of 9-11 and, and the anthrax attacks, which were right on the heels of those attacks, uh, the union representatives were very concerned about sending their workers back into these post offices because the anthrax had been detected. And so workers were going to work. Uh, they were contaminated with the anthrax, and then they were going home to their families. So a lot of the union stewards and union presidents were very concerned about sending their workers back into those facilities. So the post office was, the postal unions were faced with a dilemma. Uh, they could not go to work, uh, and, and the mail would not go through to every home and business in America six days a week. It would have, I think, caused great damage at that moment, after the 9-11 attacks, to have commerce stop. So a lot of those union representatives came up to the Hill to talk to Congress. And a lot of them spent official time on, on that issue, because, especially because of the deaths of those two workers. Now, at the end of the day, I think they made a very courageous decision. They said, we are going to go to work. Now, I have two sisters that are, work at the post office, and I know they, and they both had young kids at the time. They were very concerned about you know, contaminating themselves and their kids. They made a decision that they would go to work. I think you know, we have never really thanked the postal workers, you know, the clerks, the mail handlers, the letter carriers, the supervisors, the, post, the uh, 
uh, postmasters for the work that they did during that very critical time and, and the courage that they, they showed in, in a very difficult time. They did, they did the, the, the patriotic thing. They went to work. But they also used those, those rights that, that you are trying to limit here today, or speaking against some of you. And, uh, you know, that not only protected American workers in the workplace, but it also protected the public. And it protected, you know, families and kids. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think some legislation here is actually a problem in, a problem in well, a, a solution in search of a problem, I guess, what I would call this uh, H.R. 122. I have talked to a lot of the uh, Federal manager groups. This issue never comes up. We are in a mess here in Washington. The debt limit, the budget, we got problems, we are in three wars. I talk to these managers all the time, Federal managers, because I am a member, member of this committee, ranking Democrat. This issue never comes up, never. And here we are, we are having a full-blown hearing, and this now apparently is the, the issue du jour. It is another way to, to, to get back at the unions or get back at workers to try to, you know, try to exercise their rights. These workers don't even have the right to strike. They, got, they have very few rights, these workers. They are they're allowed to complain, but they, by God, they better keep on working. They don't even have the right to strike. We have stripped that away from them because we have said your public service is, is, uh, you know, is so important. And this is the way we, we treat them. I think it is disgraceful. I really do. I think uh, we ought to treat our workers better, especially Federal workers. If we want good people to want to come to work uh, in the service of their government, we have got to stop trashing them. We have to start thinking about how we might make these jobs uh, have a little bit more dignity, treat them with a little bit more dignity, what they have what they've earned. And, uh, you know, like those postal, postal workers who went to work in spite of the anthrax and, the, the, you know, the, the two workers who died in the performance of their duty. And, and not, I didn't even mention the 335 firefighters that went up the stairs at, on 9-11, on or the 72 police officers, all the EMS workers who went up the stairs on 9-11 at the North and South Towers at the World Trade Center when everybody else was going out. You forget the fact that every single one of those firefighters, those EMS workers and those police officers, every single one of them had a union card in their pocket. Every single one of them. And this is how we, we repay them. I have I, I, extended my time and I, I appreciate the courtesy, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your uh, leadership on this uh, subcommittee on this issue and so many others. Uh, Mr. Curry, are there certain categories of Federal employees who are not able to unionize? Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Congressman. Uh, the, the labor statute does exclude certain categories of employees from unionizing. Uh, you might have uh, employees that might be involved in uh, intelligence, for example. Uh, managers can organize. Uh, uh, certain other categories would include, like, uh, um, labor relations professionals, uh, such as myself. How about bureau agents? F FBI. Uh, they are excluded by law from being covered under the labor relations statute. Well, I can't think of a category of employees who would be more interested in workplace safety than bureau agents. So who advocates on their behalf? I don't have an answer for that question, Congressman. Well, they are not unionized, so nobody is taking official time, correct? That, that would be my estimation, yes. You agree with me that no category of Federal employees would have more calls for concern for workplace safety than FBI agents, and yet no one is being paid to advocate on their behalf. Agreed? Uh, sir, I would certainly say that all employees would want someone to advocate for them. I don't know how they do it at the FBI. What about the Drug Enforcement Administration? Would you agree with me that they are not able to unionize? Uh, I believe that is correct, but I don't know for certain, sir. What about ATF agents? Uh, again, I don't know for certain, sir. Secret Service agents? Uh, I believe they are not organized. ICE? Uh, uh, actually, they are organized. Immigration and customs are, or, yes, are unionized? Yes, sir. So what about Federal prosecutors? Uh, I 
don't have an answer for that. I don't believe they are, but I don't have that information, sir. So you can advocate. You can lobby Congress. You can advocate for workplace safety. You can do all of that outside a union and on your own time. Well, I mean, ultimately, sir, I would think that when employees organize, it is basically a labor union is providing a collective voice for the, the workforce. Uh, I think that is ultimately the idea with labor organizations and collective bargaining being found to be in the public interest. I am going to try my question again. Yes, uh, bureau agents, ATF agents, DEA agents, federal prosecutors, all are concerned with workplace safety, including their own lives. Mm -hmm. They can't un unionize, but yet they can still advocate on their behalf, correct? Uh, I, I assume so, sir. Uh, the other law enforcement organizations do have labor unions. Uh, uh, as far as uh, police officers, uh, uh, they are organized in the Federal Government. Right. I thought we were primarily talking about Federal employees today, though. We, well, we do have Federal police officers. Can you tell me your do you agree, rather, the phrase reasonable, necessary, in the public interest? Uh, that seems somewhat vague and overly broad. Do you agree or disagree? It is open to interpretation, sir. Uh, How do you interpret it? Uh, well, ultimately, uh, since that is a contractual form of official time, that is where the parties, where there is a collective bargaining relationship, labor and management, they have to have a meeting of the minds on what they agree to be reasonable, necessary, and in the public interest uh, as it relates to their organization, their mission, and the circumstances of what is happening in that organization. Uh, my colleague from Florida asked a question, and uh, I want to follow up um, whether or not there are Federal employees who are on 100 percent official time. Uh, yes, there are, sir. And can you give me a rough estimate of how many Federal employees are on 100 percent uh, official we, time? We do not track how many employees are on official time, but the hours for that official time would be included the total hours reported by each agency. Where could curious folks go to find the answer to that question? We would have to ask the agencies to, to identify that information to us. How troublesome is that to it, do? It, uh, we have actually posed that question. It is, a, it is a lengthy process. They have to go out and gather that information for us. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I will, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would yield back the remainder of my time. Uh, thank you. I see they have called us for votes. We will try to get some of these in right now. And I will uh, recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee from uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Gage, as members of this committee know firsthand from our hearing in April with Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, there is an effort in states uh, controlled by Republican governors to diminish or totally eliminate public sector unions. As we also know from Governor Scott uh, Walker's testimony, he admitted that there was no budget savings uh, basis for his effort to rescind collective bargaining for public sector workers, while he used the State's budget problems as a pretense to roll back collective bargaining. It was not a valid reason for doing so, and the State would reap no budget savings by doing so. I wonder if we don't see the same thing here today at this hearing. Um, Mr. Gage, in your opinion, does the Gingrey bill share in common any resemblance to the legislative efforts in the Republican-controlled states to curtail public sector collective bargaining? Well, Congressman, I am trying to be positive with this hearing, thinking it is an honest look at, at something that, uh, that, that clearly is within Congress's purview. But when you take away official time, the way collective bargaining is set up in the Federal sector, you take away collective bargaining. You can't have a contract without enforcing it. And the official time from our volunteer reps, uh, that is how contracts are enforced. You take that away and, it's, and the contract becomes uh, meaningless. But, you know, this is not the first time we have discussed this. And these agencies just didn't fall off a turnip truck. They take strict accounting. All official time is approved. It is on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And those who are on official time, 100 percent, they are running Big unions, for instance, the Bureau of Prisons, our council there, the council president is on 100 percent time. But he is working usually in management's lap almost every day. 
Uh, same with our, our president of our VA council, which has 90,000 members in VA hospitals all over the country. Uh, she is on 100 percent, but works closely day by day with management. And it's just a more efficient way of, of, uh, of, of doing things. Well, let, so, me, let, me, let me give Mr. Veronico uh, a little help, say here, because we don't have much time. Um, Mr. Vernuccio? Okay. Uh, Renuccio, yes. As you know, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin kind of boasted, uh, boosted, boasted his anti-union political intentions to a person who was calling for a status report while posing as one of the Koch brothers. Governor Walker received a great deal of support from the Koch brothers in his political campaign, and I'm wondering if the Koch brothers have backed you or your organization as well, and have you or the Committee Enterprise Institute received money from the Koch brothers or any organization supported financially by them? Uh, Congressman, for my project at the Institute, I can say with 100 percent certainty, no, we have not received any Koch money. Our money comes from small donations through direct mail, primarily from across the country. For the larger Institute, I am almost positive we have not received any money from the Koch Foundation, but I cannot be 100 percent sure And, Mr. Shirk, uh, the same question for you. Have you, have the Koch brothers funded your organization as well? Do you know? Uh, I believe they gave a, a relatively uh, small amount. It is less than 1 percent of our budget. Uh, What's exactly your budget? How much. Uh, I would I, have to look at our annual report. I, I don't know that. Well, that. let me inform you all what I know. It might interest you that, and members of the committee uh, to know that the Koch brothers have been substantial, substantial funders of both your organizations. According to publicly available information, Mr. Shirk, your organization received over a million dollars from the Koch brothers, and yours, Mr. Renuccio, received over $350,000. Um, and so will each of you provide this committee with details of the funding support your organization have received from the Koch brothers in each of the past five years so that we can be clear on this? Would you do that for us? Sure. Thank you very much. Would you do that for us, Mr. Shirk? Uh, I, I believe it is publicly available, but uh, Mr. No, I want it from you. Since you just testified that it is a small portion, less than 1 percent, I think you said. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Now, let me, um, Mr. Renuccio, you are here to support the Gingrey Bill, and I wonder if you or the Competitive Enterprise Institute has prepared any testimony or analysis for any effort in any State to curtail collective bargaining of public sector workers there. Uh, any other testimony? Yes. Um, we are preparing studies on pro-worker legislation and pro-worker movements across the state. So the answer is yes or no? Uh, the answer is on our website, yes, we do have uh, pro-worker bills. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I recognize the uh, delegate from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there is a difference between <laughs> learning how funds are spent and not wanting funds to be spent at all. Uh, just let me indicate my sadness at having witnesses come before us today um, testifying in, in a way that can leave no doubt that they do not believe in the right to collectively bargain at all. Uh, I commend to you the history of authoritarian governments. You know, there are four or five things that they oppose, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the right to organize. And the right to organize and join a union means the right to operate that union. So let's look at the cost, since that, that's the uh, pretext uh, being used here. There's a cost here only if you think of, uh, that Americans who work for the Federal Government don't have the right to, to organize, because let's look at it. They can't bargain for wages. Certainly no cost there. Uh, gentlemen, let me suggest to you that unions subsidize, subsidize the Federal Government uh, through the duties they carry out as a consequence of achieving the right to organize. Um, for example, are you aware, I assume you are aware, that unions have to organize and carry the grievances of people who pay no union dues and are not members of the union. Are you aware of that? 
Uh, Congressman, in many cases, unions do not have to represent um, nonmembers, uh, especially in front of the Member Systems Protection Board and uh, in front of U.S. Are Congress. you aware that most Federal Government unions, in fact, uh, carry the, um, must carry, uh, must bargain for all employees? I believe that is a portion of their exclusive bargaining. Mr. Agreement. Gage, would you uh, answer the question, please? We have to represent all employees in grievances. If there is a statutory uh, avenue for an employee and he chooses to go that way, we don't have to represent them. But in all grievances under a contract, we have to represent the member and the nonmember. That is Federal law. Let me ask both of you who uh, appear to believe that $130 million, that to you, I, that shocks your conscience. Is that the, the amount of money that is spent? Uh, according to the official report, that, that, that you find uh, too much money, too much taxpayers' money to pay for what the taxpayers get in return? $130 million is a small part of the overall budget, but it is still an enormous amount of money, and we would like to see it spent well. Uh, how would you set up? The Federal Government has set up this system. Not, not out of its beneficent to the workers, but because it is the most efficient way to deal with problems that arise in the workplace. You who would not have official time used, how would you deal with complaints that arise every day in a large workforce inevitably uh, if there was no official time and no designated person chosen to carry out uh, the responsibilities of settling those uh, issues? Well, what I uh, set forward in the, uh, the written uh, statement was that uh, what I would do is you know, end the official time, but then uh, also end the exclusive representation requirement so that they would have no, uh, no obligation to represent nonmembers. If an individual Federal employee believes that the, the union representation is a value to them, they should pay the, the union dues, which so, can so be several you, hundred So you think the, the, the statute is, is, uh, is at fault by saying that Mr. Gage has to represent all members regardless of whether or not they pay dues. Now, you think people who don't pay dues uh, should not be represented in their grievances and should be what? I, I don't think we should have exclusive representation. If, if so, how should, be represented. So, so how should those, how should those employees uh, deal with their grievances? Well, it should be their choice. If you want the union representation and you want the, the benefits of a contract, you know, sign up and pay union dues. If you don't think of it uh, of much value, uh, there has been a, a of... there's been a union election, Mr. Shirk. The majority have joined the union. Uh, do you believe in majority rule? Well, the majority wants to be represented. We're not going to leave out people uh, who decided uh, that who voted against the union. You think that's unfair? Uh, well, what I'm proposing is that I, I mean, if you like Coke or li you like Pepsi at a party, you can pick whichever one you like. You're not required to, to go with what the majority choose. That's what I'm suggesting. Those who value union and representation of, and, pay for And it. you do not concede that there are any efficiencies for the Federal Government in having labor peace through grievances dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis through union representation? The, the gentlelady's time has expired. Could I ask you just get an answer to it? To if you please, the answer, and then we'll have to adjourn. Uh, there, there may certainly be, uh, be some efficiencies, uh, but there's, there's also uh, certainly some costs there, and a lot of frivolous grievances are filed. Yeah. Uh, to the tune of $130 million. Thank you. With, uh, upon agreement with uh, the ranking member of the, the subcommittee, we are going to adjourn at this point. And I appreciate the witnesses being here. And with that, this subcommittee stands adjourned.